your purpose in life was a fork, do you ever think it would look something like this? A lot of times when we look at our life and we look at our purpose and our direction and where we're heading and we think about this whole series that we're in, Don't Worry, Be Happy, we think about the steps that we've taken in life, we think about what our purpose truly is and we know God has a purpose, but then we look at our life and see how they line up and a lot of times it looks a little bit like this. It's kind of twisted and distorted and we get off track and it happens to all of us, but Jesus is sharing with us in Matthew chapter 5, if you've got your Bibles you can be turning there today, uh, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes, the Blessed R's uh, that we've been going through. We're in week four of our series, uh, Matthew chapter five. We're looking at the first 12 verses of that chapter. And in, in that first five verses, we looked on the first week at happy are the humble, at the meek and humility that uh, God wants to bring about in our lives. Those who mourn, uh, blessed are the hungry, uh, was the second week in verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And that kind of ties to our topic for today. Last week we looked at verse number seven, happy are the helpful, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And then today we're going to look at two key verses, verses eight and nine. And those two key verses will lead us to discover our topic, happy are the holy, happy are the holy. We don't feel very holy at times when we go through life and we look at the fork of the purpose of our life and it's twisted and, and torn and twisted and demented and all over the map at times, but God has a plan for us to be holy and has the ability that he wants to impart to us. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, uh, the apostle Paul writes that we can have, in verse 7 of chapter 4, a peace that passes all understanding. As you're in the world today and you look at the uncertainties, the world at times looks like this big question mark as we look around. We wonder, What's the government going to do next? What decisions are they going to make that's going to affect my job? What decisions will my employer make? Will I have a job next month? Many of you may be asking. You may be wondering how it is that you're going to make it to the next step of your journey, how you're going to make it through this trial or this tribulation or this hard step or hard decision that you have to make. And the uncertainties of the world at times make it feel like it's impossible for us to pursue happiness and the happiness Jesus is talking about isn't the kind of happiness that we get when we buy some new clothes or get a new car or get something new or anything new stuff, that fleeting temporary happiness. The happiness Jesus is describing means, that's the word blessed, blessed are thee. The word blessed means joyful, fulfillment, peace, contentment. It leads to all of these things in our life that we're full. It's more than a fleeting happiness, but a lasting joy that Jesus wants to give to you and bless you with. But it feels impossible, wouldn't you agree, at times to pursue such a happiness, such a joy and a contentment, a peace that passes all understanding, that Paul says will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That was right after he said, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry. Don't worry. Be happy. Seems impossible at times. And when it feels impossible to find that contentment or that joy or that purpose or meaning or happiness, it certainly feels impossible to live a holy life, right? So many times we realize that God said, be holy for I am holy. But when we can't even find happiness and contentment and joy that we can build our life upon, it feels impossible to even think about trying to be holy. But the question I want us to explore today is what if, what if, this holiness and this happiness that we often pursue and feel like we come short of, what if both of those weren't any longer something to be hoped for but became a reality in our life? How different would your life look if you had a holiness and a happiness that only Jesus could give? And that's what we're going to discover in verses 8 and 9 of Matthew chapter 5. And it's definitely going to take some discipline in life, for sure, to be holy and to live life God's way. Uh, it takes discipline. Now, discipline usually means that you do something you don't want to do so that you can have something that you don't currently have or some future expectation. I'm disciplined. I don't want to do this, but I need to do this, right? Anybody have any discipline areas in your life where you need to do something that you don't want to do? How many runners or cyclists or avid exercisers do we have in the room? Lift them high. Come on. I know there's more. You're the ones with the energy in the room, right? Okay. If you're a runner, if you have seen me about two years ago, I was about 45 pounds heavier than I am now, and it took some running for me, and I hate to run. I was an athlete in high school, ran every single day, uh, and hated it then. I hate it even as much now, but what I started to discover about running is even though I hated it, I started to love it because I love the feeling of putting my foot down over that little finish line. For some of us, it's three miles. For some, it may be five or 10 or more. For some of us, it's to the end of the road where the stop sign is, right? 
but it feels good to make it, to be disciplined enough to get there. But a lot of times those disciplines become more than something that you have to do that you don't want to do. They become an obsession. They become a part of who you are in your life. And runners, you may agree and have experienced that, or you may have seen that in other areas of your life, but that's how holiness can be. It can become a part of who you are, not just something that you strive for, that you have to do, but you don't want to. It becomes a want to, not a have to, because you start to understand who God is, how holy he is, and what he wants to do in your life. And so it'll take some discipline, but the bottom line today is this. If you're taking notes, the bottom line is that even though holiness is impossible, and it is because we're human, and we cannot achieve that holiness and perfection, that standard of perfection that Jesus put forward, but impossible holiness is possible through him. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26. He said, for with man, this is impossible, but with God, say it with me if you know it, all things are possible. Holiness is possible, even though it feels impossible for you today. We're going to look at how that is the case. We're going to look today at two holy heart issues because Jesus is addressing here, and if you're a part of our DFF, Discover Financial Freedom campaign, uh, it is about how we manage God's resources and our finances, and we have about a, over a thousand people participating in that, about 700 or so adults, plus our students and children that are going through that, and you may or may not be one of those people, but you are impacted even if you're not going through a class, because we're using this as something, a springboard for us to even discuss the attitudes and the motives of the heart. The people that are going through the Dave Ramsey courses are learning that it's a little bit more deep than just changing one action. It's because we know if we change an action and just change the action for a little while, that's probably going to be fleeting like those disciplines. I don't always run quite as much as I used to. I told you it became an obsession. I'll tell you it's not been an obsession over the winter. <laughs> it's a little cold and it's a lot easier to stay inside and watch something on the television. But there's a deeper issue when it comes to finances in this campaign that we're going through churchwide. When it comes to don't worry, be happy in the Beatitudes, the issue is a heart issue. It's an attitude issue. It's something that permeates what we do, not because we're doing it, but because it's at the core of who we are. And that's what God wants to see holiness become in our lives. And so I want to talk through two holy heart issues. And the first one comes from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, and it is private purity. So number one is private purity. And we'll see the word pure in heart listed here, and we'll get to the word private in just a moment. But we'll start in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 5. If you're ready for the word, say amen. amen. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Many of us feel like God's invisible at times, and we long for the day maybe we can bow at his feet. But at times in our life, though we know he's there, he feels invisible. Uh, and yet we're still called to be pure in heart, and we'll be blessed to see God and experience what he has for our life. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. No matter your background, no matter what family base you may have, however may wide it may be or whatever it is, you have a father in heaven who loves you. And you can be called sons of God and be blessed to be a part of that family because God made peace with us. And so the first issue is private purity. Private purity. And as we look at that, uh, I want to give you a couple of statements today. Uh, the first thing I want you to know is that purity is a heart issue much more than it is a head issue. It's more about the motives of your heart than it is a mindset of your head. Many times we think that purity and holiness, first of all, we think maybe it's just about sexual purity or those kind of things, but the pure in heart pursuit that Jesus is talking about goes much more deep than that. This pure in heart, this purity that Jesus describes is something that goes deeper than us striving for something. It goes deeper than our effort we can put forward. It goes down to our hearts. Why he uses the word heart. It's a heart issue that goes down to the motives of our heart that God will even change and remodel in your own life. The statement I want to give you that we're going to build this around today is that purity is not about public recognition, but about a private realization. Write that down if you're taking notes. Purity is not about public recognition, but about private realization. The more we privately, internally realize how holy God is and come to respect that, first of all, the bigger you see God to be, the more holy you see God to be, the smaller you'll see yourself to be, right? You've experienced that if you've ever looked at the character of God. But when you do that, not just will you respect God for how holy he is internally, you'll start to realize that God has imparted that holiness and righteousness to you. He's given it to you, and he wants you to be able to live that out even in your life, as difficult as the circumstances of your life may be. God wants to do that in and through your life. But Jesus describes this better than anyone else in Matthew chapter 6. So if you'll flip over a page or so to Matthew chapter 6, 
Jesus talks about the difference between a public recognition that we so often go for and a private realization of who God is and who God wants us to be. So let's look at Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds. Many versions will read acts of righteousness. So acts of purity, holy deeds here, before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Now, Paul's there. You've seen that before. That's the people that when the offering basket comes around, they flip the check with the writing up so everybody can see. Say, hey, you see, see how much I'm giving. And in the temple, in the early temple when Jesus was writing, there was what was called the giving of alms. And people would line up at the temple, those that were, had needs, and they would want people to help them meet those needs. And some people would go through maybe more discreetly and others, you know, kind of stomp through and I'm here, you know, look at me, I'm holy, I'm giving, my check is turned up and I'm giving to these people. And you've seen that even in church. A lot of times people do things just to be seen by others. And this is what Jesus has to say about such people. He says, as we continue on there in verse two, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory for men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Meaning that the recognition, the public recognition they'll get, you may get some, but that will be the reward in and of itself. That's it. That's where it stops. But Jesus continues, and I love that Jesus never leaves us hanging. So many times the things Jesus said points out those things that stomp our toes and make us realize how far away from his purpose that he's called us to be, how twisted that fork of our life really is, but he never leaves it there. He gives us that next step and makes a way for us to be who he's called us to be, and that's what he does here beginning in verse 3. He says, but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, meaning just do it in secret, that your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. I love that phrase that our father who sees in secret. A lot of you cringe at that thought. The private corners of the closets of your life that God would see that scares you to death. And it does me as well, and it does any of us, because we all have imperfections, impurities, that really do not fit the holiness that God has called us to. But God sees those things, but God also sees the motives of your heart when you do things the right way. Think of a time in your life when you did something nobody else knew about. Maybe you did something anonymously, gave a gift, or cleaned up. You walked through the worship center here, and somebody had dropped a candy wrapper, and you picked it up. Nobody saw you, and you threw it in the trash can. Nobody sees that, right? Wrong. God's looking. God knows the motives of your heart, and he sees in secret. And he continues on and gives many other examples. But in verse 19, is something that we've read and looked at even in this series, Jesus continues, verse 19 of Matthew chapter 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." And that's what God wants to do in your life, that you would do what you do, that you would strive to be holy, not for public recognition or selfish personal gain, but for a private realization that God is holy and he's created you to be holy. Now, a lot of you have illustrated one side or the other, maybe even this weekend. We talked about the tension that comes from the uncertainties of the world, and a lot of times you had a bad weekend, and that tension builds in your family. And on the way to church, and and yes, it happens to all of us, even pastors and all of us have this happen, the tension builds, and you may even have a big knockdown, drag-out fight on the way to church, right? Anybody ever done that? No, because you guys are holy. That wouldn't happen, right? So, but it happens, and the tension builds, and you feel, and sometimes you come in church, and you sit, and you just feel like the tension's there, but on the outside, what do we look like? We have what I call the church smile, because as soon as our foot hits the pavement, and the greeter says, how are you doing? We go, there's mine. Now you practice yours. Look to your neighbor. Give them your best church smile. Go ahead. You're wondering what you look like, so now you know <laughs> You step out and you say, hey, brother, how you doing today? And you put on that smile and there is a time and place for the knockdown drag outs and we do prefer they don't happen in the worship center. But, but we do believe here at Midway, and this is why we believe so much in life groups, that you can be real because you're not perfect and you're not holy apart from Jesus Christ. And there is gonna be tension. And some of you feel that on the inside right now. You feel like it's just shaking and pulling, pulling you apart. And there's these things you have to deal with and you don't wanna have to deal with them. On the outside, you can look cool, but God sees in secret. He knows your heart and he's working in your life. And he wants you to know that through Jesus Christ, you too can be holy as he is holy. That's what it means to be pure 
in heart. And so as you think about that, uh, there's a a quote from D.L. Moody that I found this week. I think sums it up very well when it comes to this private realization instead of this public recognition motive. He said, if I take care of my character, my reputation will take care of itself. If you take care of the inside, your walk with God, that private purity that only comes from knowing and walking with him and letting him empower you and his holiness to be the doctrinal theological term is imputed. It means it was taken from one spot and put on another, imputed, given to you, put on you. The righteousness of Jesus was given and put on you if you have a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, if that happens in your life and you have the righteousness of God inside of you, you don't always walk it out, do you? Because you still have a choice and you still take your steps But when that starts to take over and that becomes the motive of your heart and the character becomes your focus, then the reputation, the public recognition starts to take care of itself. And God will do that in your life. Looking this week at the water purification process, thinking about what it means to be pure. And we'll drink water and we don't think anything of it, but there's a process that gets you to that. And there's three basic steps. Some of you know many more steps that are inside of these steps than I do, but there was three main steps I discovered. And they were decontamination or the contaminants, the things that we don't need to ingest and drink as humans are removed, decontamination, purification, which involves a filtering process of continuing to clean up the water where it removes things and makes sure that it's ready for us to drink. And then there is the sanitization where it's finalized, the process is finalized, and it involves involves several cycles of hot water. Hot water is applied where it heats it up and cools it down. And you're wondering, how in the world does that have anything to do with me? I started to think about the purification process, not just of water, but how that would tie the purification process for a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And we too go through, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you, go, you have gone through a season, a phase of decontamination. It's called salvation. The contaminant called sin that separates you from God because you're not holy and he is holy separates you from God in such a way that it contaminates your eternity. But Jesus came that that contamination should be removed. Then you go through this process of sanctification that we can tie to purification. Purification. You learn to filter things through your faith just as their water is filtered and those things are continued to be removed. And then you get to the sanitization, the finalization of your walk with God. And one of these days, it's going to be final, amen, and we're going to spend eternity with him and be perfect and holy and not have to worry about the old flesh that surrounds us even today. And we'll be sanitized completely, ready for eternal usage. And as you think about that for us, I like the hot water cycle side of that, that things are heated up. How many of you at times feel like you're in a hot water cycle and things heat up in life? And some of you are here today and you're in hot water right now. But I want you to know that your opportunity to be holy and to live out your faith will never be greater, hear me, than in times of hot water, than in times of testing, than in times of trial, when it's the most difficult to live out that holiness that God has given to you through his son, Jesus Christ, that's when people are watching the most. That's when your voice is louder than ever before. And God wants to use that voice to make you into the believer and the follower of him that he's made you to be. And so for you, Today, that could mean many different things. I want you to think about an enemy, perhaps, that you've made in life. And there's a verse I want to read to you. You can jot it down. It's Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 7. Proverbs 16, 7. And it says this. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, I found an illustration of this. I think that's pretty clear. Anybody ever seen one of these before? Don't act like you didn't eat the chicken, too. I'll tell you, this wasn't purchased for looks. It's empty now, pretty flat. I like chicken. I believe in chicken. But Chick-fil-A, awesome organization, and this was purchased yesterday, by the way, because they're not open on Sundays, right? But when you think about Chick-fil-A, and I know probably most of you have not heard of this, but they've been under a little bit of scrutiny, right? A little controversy. You probably never heard of it, but they're under a lot of scrutiny, and there's some controversy surrounding their stand on biblical principles, particularly in the area of their belief of the traditional view of marriage as a man and a woman pertaining to homosexuality. And it's drawn a lot of attention, uh, but there's an illustration I want to read to you, and I'm not here to dive into that controversy other than to tell you, first of all, I like chicken. We believe in chicken at Midway, and we also, other than that, we believe on every single word that the Bible says. If the Bible says it's sin, it's sin. If the Bible says it's right, it's right. 
But when you think about that, and so that now that that's settled, there's actually a good illustration that we can learn from the owner of Chick-fil-A, and I want to read that to you. There was an article written by Jim Daly. Jim Daly is the president of Focus on the Family, an international Christian organization that helps families in many different respects you may have heard of. And Jim Daly wrote this about Dan Cathy, who is now the uh, president of Chick-fil-A, son of the founder, Truett Cathy. He says this, Dan Cathy is the president of Chick-fil-A, son of the company's founder, Truett Cathy. Dan is also a friend of mine, and I was reminded again this week of how much I appreciate the man when I saw a column about him written by a homosexual activist in the Huffington Post. And so that's what, he, that's what I'm going to read to you. And the man's name is Shane L. Winmeyer, and he's, the, he's an author, and he's the executive director of Campus Pride. It's a homosexual advocacy organization. So the enemy, right, you would think, of Chick-fil-A. And this is what he had to say about Dan Cathy. He writes, I spent New Year's Eve at the red-blooded, all-American epicenter of college football at the Chick-fil-A Bowl, next to Dan Cathy as his personal guest. I've come to know him and Chick-fil-A in ways that I would have not thought possible. How could I dare to think to have a relationship with a man and a company that have advocated against who I am, who would take apart my family in the name of traditional marriage, whose voice and views represented exactly the opposite of the students for whom I advocate every day? Dan is the problem, and Chick-fil-A is the enemy, right? And then Jim Daly continues and writes that Mr. Winmeyer went on to say that Dan had reached out to him. Dan, Kathy, reached out to him with no agenda. Kind of reminds you of that public recognition versus the private realization. He realized what God's doing in his life with no agenda other than to listen or talk with him. And then Steve continued and wrote this. Through all this, Dan and I shared respectful, enduring communication and built trust. His demeanor has always been one of kindness and openness, even when I continued to directly question his public actions and the funding decisions. Dan embraced the opportunity to have dialogue and to hear my perspective. Then he concluded his say, his, his article about Dan Cathy by saying this: "Our mutual hope was to find common ground if possible and to build respect no matter what. We learned about each other as people with opposing views, not as opposing people. I learned about his wife and kids and gained an appreciation for his devout belief in Jesus Christ and his commitment to being a, quote, follower of Christ more than a, quote, Christian. Dan expressed regret and genuine sadness when he heard of people being mistreated by, in the name of Chick-fil-A, but he offered no apologies for his genuine beliefs about marriage. What an awesome example of a man. Go ahead. What an awesome example of a man that God's called us to be and a woman that God's called us to be that says, I am going to stand on the principles of God's word, unwavering. I will always hold to what the Bible says. I will always hold to my faith in Jesus Christ, but I'm gonna do so in a way that even my enemies, I can be at peace with him because my ways are gonna please the Lord, Proverbs 16, 7. I'm gonna follow God, but I'm gonna do so in a way that shows his love and his word and his life through my life, so that even my so-called enemies could see Jesus for who he really is. Now, the man that wrote that article doesn't, certainly doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, as Dan would believe in Jesus Christ, but you heard he even mentioned his name and saw him even for who he really is, saw that Dan was more a follower, a disciple of Jesus than just a so-called, quote-unquote, Christian that society has stereotyped Christians to be. Now, that's what God wants to do with you. He wants to use the holiness of Jesus to change even your life and even make you at peace with your enemies. So that's private purity, but it leads us to that thought of peace. Matthew 5, 9 said, for us to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And the second point today is is public peace. Private purity that leads us to public peace, and it comes from public peace. If you have your Bibles, flip over to the book of Titus, over several books to the right. And that'll be our last scripture we'll turn to today. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. As you're turning there, I want us to consider Jesus and what he came to this earth to do. When you think about the purpose of your life and how it gets twisted, Jesus did not have a twisted, distorted purpose. He came with one clear purpose, one clear thought in mind, and he came to make peace between God and man. He came because we are unholy, 
so that he could make peace between us and God by dying on the cross for our sins, and nothing was going to deter Jesus from that. Some of you would be classified as peacekeepers. There's a big difference in being a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. A peacekeeper is just a pacifier, somebody that wants to please everybody, make everybody happy, but a peacemaker does whatever it takes to bring about peace, even if that whatever it takes is something that's very uncomfortable. There's a big difference in the two, but Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker, coming to remove our sin and make us to be holy so we could spend eternity with him through his grace. But Jesus was also a pacemaker. Jesus set the pace for the church. He instituted the church and said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He started something. He set the pace for something that his disciples and that we would follow. And we're ultimately here today because of the pace Jesus set. And as a peacemaker, you too can be a pacemaker for others. You can set the pace and be that example that God has called for you to be. But it comes from us not building our effort, hear me, not from us building our effort based on how good we can do and how hard we can try, but on the evidence of the vertical peace that we have with God. And that's the thought that I'll challenge you to write down is that holiness is birthed from evidence, not from effort. That doesn't mean we don't put forth effort. We already talked about the discipline it takes to be holy. It means that the evidence of our vertical relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus was a peacemaker, came and died on the cross for us. And when we show evidence of that, we are the evidence of that. It means that our effort no longer comes from us, but our effort comes from the evidence of the peace that we have with God. When we have peace with God and we realize we are the temple, Paul says, and we realize, 1 Peter chapter 4, that we are stewards or managers of God's very grace, that we not only receive that grace, but we also carry that grace and manage it and send it out to other people. We realize that we've got something available to us that's even greater than we ever even dreamed possible. And we realize that we can be a pacemaker as Jesus was, and it's more about the evidence of that relationship with him than it is the effort we put forth. It changes the effort and it changes the follow through and the whole way through. So look there at Titus chapter two, verses 11 through 14. Ready for the words? Amen. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Everybody say the next two words with me. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, from all the unholiness in our life, and purify, purify, pure hearts, purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, passionate about holiness, Now, you notice that that was all about the grace of God because when you look in the mirror, and hopefully you looked in the mirror at some point this morning, some of us looked and wanted to turn and run, go back to bed, but you got up and you came and you endured through that. But when we look in the mirror, we realize we don't have much holiness that's there. When we think about our past and our mind and our actions, and we look in the mirror and we see ourselves for who we really are, we realize we need more than anything, not for horizontal pressure from people to come and stomp our toes and say, go do something, but you'll start to want to do something when you look at the vertical grace that God has given you. And then all the guilt stuff becomes that I'm going to live out what God has done in my life because of who he is and because of who he has made me to be. All the effort that I put forth in my life comes from who he is and what he wants me to do, not as a have to, remember the discipline, not as a have to, but but as I want to, I want to be holy because I realize people look at me and they look to see if they can find Jesus. They look to see if they can find peace and hope and contentment. Don't worry, be happy. If we're living that out, people are looking to us to see where it's coming from. And I want to tell you, it comes not from how good we are and our own efforts that we can put forward because we're not all that good when it comes down to it. It comes from the evidence of that vertical peace that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants to do in your heart and life. And I want to tell you, Jesus will always take you as you are. Jesus will always take you as you are, but he will never, ever, ever leave you that way. Jesus will take you as you are, but he will never leave you that way. He'll remold you and reshape you from the torn, twisted purpose that you have in your life and the unholiness and make you into who he wants you to be. And that's what God wants to do in your heart even today. And I want to give you another thought, not just as that holiness birthed from the evidence of our relationship with God, that public peace. Holiness is based on facts and not feelings. Based on facts and not feelings. 
How many of you would agree with me that there are many days you get up every week where you don't feel very holy? You look in the mirror and you realize, I don't look very holy. I know the Bible says that I'm the temple of God. I understand that I am the church. We're not called to go to church, but to be the church. And if that's the case, and I'm the temple of God, I don't feel very holy. I don't feel like I'm a very good temple. And you're probably not. You're right. I'll tell you that first. But then you realize, I don't even feel like trying to be holy. Many days we get up and say, I just, and I'll tell you, I feel that way as a pastor. Uh, Many days, ministry's draining, life is draining, the world is draining, and many days you wake up and you say, I don't feel like doing this today. I don't feel like pursuing the holiness God's called me to. And that's going to happen a lot. And you're right, you're not holy, and you're not going to feel like pursuing it. Because feelings are like this. They're up and they're down and they go left and they go right and they'll take you every which way. But I want you to know today that being holy is not based on how you feel. It's based on the facts of God's word and what Jesus came to do and that he is going to do it until it's completed. He's going to complete in you that holiness and that finished work of Christ, that workmanship that he created you to be until one day you can finally be with him. I want you to look at a picture on the screen that we shared a couple of times, uh, maybe a year or two ago, but it illustrates this point so well. And this picture is actually taken and recreated from the Beginning Steps booklet that we give out to people who pray to receive Christ. Uh, If you're in the beginning steps of your walk with God, maybe a new believer or needing to get baptized, we give these out. And it says, do not depend on feelings. And you notice, we'll just call this the train of your life. Many days we get up and we don't feel like being holy. We don't feel holy. And as you see on the screen, it's the caboose in this picture. But a lot of times those feelings become the engine that drives our life. And as we feel, so we go. As we feel, so we do. If we feel like it, we'll do it. If we don't, we won't. But the biblical model is that the fact of God's word is that Jesus is holy. You're not holy, but Jesus is holy. And he wants to live that out, flesh that out through your life as a believer and a disciple of his. And that is the engine. That's what drives your life. The word of God drives your life and the fact of who Jesus is, that he's holy, and because he's holy, we can be holy. The second cart you see is faith. You put your faith in the facts of God's word, and the feelings are the caboose, and when they go up and they go down, they're being drugged along by the engine, which is God's word. That's the biblical model, because you're not always going to feel holy. You're not always going to feel like you can be who God has created you to be, but even when you don't feel it, it doesn't change the fact that God will live through your life even when you don't feel that way, when you put your faith in him. And so for us today, when you think about holiness being birthed from evidence, that vertical public peace with God, when that public peace with God, that vertical relationship with his son Jesus translates into our private purity, our internal hearts and lives, you'll find that that public peace is not just public peace with God, but it becomes public peace with other people. That vertical relationship with Jesus that we put our faith in, no matter what our feelings tell us, becomes a horizontal relationship with other people. And even our enemies, when a man's ways please the Lord, Proverbs 16, 7, even our enemies can be at peace with him. Even our enemies can see that kind of peace. Now, how many of you today would say that uh, you've seen that show, Extreme Home Makeover? Probably seen that, right? The show is all about somebody that's in need. Somebody that uh, maybe has gone through a tragedy, somebody that's usually somebody that's given back to the community every single step of the way, and they deserve this new home, and so they send them away like to a big Disney vacation, right, and they go have a blast, and when they come back, this beautiful new home is built, and they unveil it to them, so if you didn't know about it, that's what the show's all about, but when you watch that show, most of the time you're already crying by the end, right? Us guys not, would never do that, but you're, you're tearing up, and you're, you, they move this thing. What do they put there in front of it? You remember? The big bus. And they get the family out, and they stand there, and they're ready to see the house. Now, you've had a few sneak peeks of the house, right? They've shown you, like, hey, I'm working on the little girl's room, and it's pink, and it's got this, and it's got that. And you're like, oh, it's going to be so sweet. And you're sitting there, and you're ready to see it, and you've got snot all over you, and you can't wait for them to move the bus. And then they set the family there. And they say three really big words, and they are? Move that bus. You haven't seen the whole house yet, and the whole point of moving the bus is that you get to see the house in its totality. You get to see the finished product, and you get to see how it affects those people's lives. But what's interesting to me, it seems like it's all about the house, right? But I want to ask you, where's the camera as soon as the bus moves? 
It's not pointing at the house. It's right on the family that's receiving the house. And the point here is that for that house, our first glimpse as viewers of this show, our first understanding, our first glimpse of the house and the finished product is found on the looks that those people have on their faces. And then we get to tour tour the house and see the finished product. And in the same way, for you and I as followers of Jesus, I want to tell you today, there is over 80%, it's estimated, in Carroll County alone, over 80% of Carroll County are in nobody's church on this given Sunday morning, on any given Sunday morning. I want to tell you today, there's people out there that are hurting. There's people out there feeling those same uncertainties and questions that we talked about in the beginning. They want to know what it means to be happy. They want to know what it means to find purpose and meaning. And they feel like their life is twisted and torn. But for so many of those people out there, outside these doors, it's comfortable here. And we create a great environment and we have a great time. And it's awesome and we get equipped and empowered by God's word to go out and make a difference. But they're still out there. They're sitting at home wondering how they're going to make it through the next day. Just like that show Their first glimpse, perhaps, their understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ, their understanding of the house, if you will, is going to come from the looks that they see on your faces and my faces. Their glimpse of God and of who Jesus is is going to come from them looking to your life and seeing the evidence of that relationship and peace with God that has become public. So many times we get those two points around, don't we? Instead of the private purity and public peace, it becomes private peace. I've got peace with God, but it's kind of, that's for me. I've got my fire insurance. I know that I'm not going to hell when I die because I have a relationship with Jesus. But it's a private issue. My faith is something private. I want to tell you today, friends, God's peace that he sent his son to bring about is no private issue. It's a public issue that we are to live out and flesh out every single day. But the whole thing is it's not based on how good you are. It's based on how good he is and he wants to be in your life. And today, that's how you can live your life. That's what Jesus has called you to. That private purity that comes from the public peace. Vertical relationship that affects everything in your life horizontally. And for you today, what does that look like? How has Jesus called you to be happy because he's called you to be holy? We you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? No one looking around and take a moment. I want to speak first of all to those of you who are here that know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have that personal relationship with him. I want to challenge you today. What's one act of holiness One act of righteousness that God wants you to take this week. One step that would show that, God, I respect your holiness, but God, I respond to that holiness by being holy the way you've called me to be holy and equipped me to be holy. What's one thing that God's laid on your heart and on your life today? If you're here today and you know Jesus and God's laid one specific thing on your heart, at least one thing, I challenge you right now, I want to pray for you about that one thing. I don't know what it is, and only God perhaps knows what that one thing is. But if you have something that God's laid on your heart as a believer today, would you slip your hand up and hold it high across the building? Keep them up. Keep them up. All across the building, you can put your hands down. God, I thank you for these who are transparent enough to say, God, I need to take some steps of holiness. God, I pray you would empower them as only you can do. God, may you live through us so that we can be holy as you are holy. Thank you for these believers. May you work in their lives that they are not called just to be, to go to church, but to be the church in the community that needs you so much. Some of you are here today with no one looking around, all heads bowed. And you would say that, you know, I I definitely could see some steps I could take, but honestly, I don't know that I have that holiness. When I look at my life, I don't know that if I were to die today that I would go to heaven. I don't know that my imperfection, my impurity that separates me from God, I don't know that I've got that resolved. The Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not maybe, but shall be saved. That means you too. It doesn't matter how twisted the fork of your life has become. And for you, you may need to cry out to Jesus today. Being saved is not about a mindset of your head. It's about a motive of your heart. Being saved is all about your heart being turned to Jesus and you saying in your own words, not in biblical terms or preacher terms or anything like that or what the preacher says, but what you say to God when you look to him and say, Jesus, I need you. And if you haven't done that, do that in your heart. Do it right now. Say, Jesus, I need you. I'm so unholy, but you're holy. 
need you to save me. Forgive me. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And I turn away from that old me and want you to give me a new me. So Jesus, I give you me right now, today. Some of you are here and you've made that all-important decision, that step, and you've received the holiness of God even this day. Even though you may not feel holy, you are holy. Because when God looks at his children, he doesn't see the imperfections. He sees the blood of Jesus. And if you made that step today and you know today was the day you prayed to receive Jesus, I want to pray for you. Nobody's going to come get you, pull you out of the service, or embarrass you at all. I just want to pray for you right now. And I'll give you some further instructions at the end of the service. But if you made that step, I want to ask you to do one simple thing. Would you just slip your hand up? Let me pray for you right now. Nobody looking around. Nobody's going to come get you. Anybody? Keep it up high. I see you in the back. Praise God. Anybody else? I see you. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. I see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Praise God. Six. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you that you're in the saving business. Thank you for these five or six and maybe even more that have prayed to receive you today. That, God, you're in the saving business. You're in the holiness business. And even though we're so unholy, you are holy. And, God, we thank you that we can partake and be a part of your story. And, God, for these that have prayed to receive you today, I pray that, Lord, we would walk alongside of them as the church you've intended us to be, that they would take the next steps in their journey. Because today's a new beginning. It's not an end. It's a beginning. And God, I thank you that the angels in heaven are celebrating right now at every sinner who comes to repentance. And we're all sinners, and we can all come to repentance. And for those that have done that today and given their hearts to you, I praise your name for that, God. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Let's get-